All right. Hey, 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 hey. Let's get, uh, see if we can stream something over here. Uh, live on YouTube. Let's do that. Uh, Good morning. Good morning. Let me see if I can get uh, some streaming material in here. See if we can get over here to uh, get some folks in here. I'm going to try to get this streamed over to YouTube. I don't know why they won't let me do that. Let's see. Admit, Jan and Peter, welcome. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. We're coming in. We're coming in. I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to stream this over to YouTube, if we can. Live on Facebook. Um, let's see here. I'm going to try to make this happen. Good morning, everyone. Give me just a minute here. <clears throat> I'm going to try to get uh, some streams so I don't have to upload this video constantly and do this. Uh, let's see. Dismiss. Go live. Can we do that there now? Let's see. Facebook live. Push it over there. I'm going to try to push it to YouTube too, but it uh, seems to be having a, a little bit of a hiccup there. Let's see what happens. Uh, what plate? See if we got this going on over here. Some people are. Uh, <clears throat> now, let's yeah. see. Okay, Facebook good. Live. Good. We're on Facebook. We're on Zoom. Uh, get everybody in here. I wish I could get it over to uh, Facebook too, or I mean uh, YouTube. Oh, I can only stream one. So I'm live on YouTube anyway. So welcome everybody. Good morning, good afternoon. I put up a little bit of an image back here. Let me switch the light over here. <clears throat> Just to have something on my wall. All this echoey, empty space is kind of weird to me, so um, I'm trying to uh, trying to put something up there. Is that look any better? No, not really. Let me glance this light on just a little more. I, there we go. That should be better. Not that I really care, but hey, you know, we got something back there. You see my wall all patched up. <laughs> So good morning, good afternoon. Hey, thanks for coming in. Um, we're coming down to the closing of all of these things for me. Um, I'm getting ready to get out of here, as everybody knows. And uh, I wanted to make sure that I can do as many of these as possible before I take off. Um, my, let's see, my internet goes off here uh, next Friday, so. I don't know how, I don't know if I can stream on my phone or if that's going to work at all. So I'm not really sure what's going to happen. Changes are coming. I know that changes are coming. So um, stay abreast. <laughs> stay. So if you don't see me for a little while, you'll know why. But I'm going to try. We'll see what happens. So um, like I said, we're, uh, I'm, I'm winding down here. Um, the last uh, probably uh after the first of the month i'm probably not going to be around too much so uh i'll be around but i'm not going to be doing this kind of stuff so these are these are short-lived um i still have a few of these if you haven't gotten one grab one thank you everybody last week that jumped in there and got them i got one to japan czech republic uh virginia um there's there's a whole bunch of them went out there so that's great because that's going to come to an end too for me and I appreciate your support on that. So today I wanted to, there's a couple of emails that came in uh, over the last week and I wanted to start by addressing um, some of those questions that people had. Um, 
Some of them are, a couple of them are what we've gone over before, but I'll try to reiterate. I kind of thought about this. I try to, I'll try to reiterate so people will have a better understanding of what they're doing. Um, when it comes to um, the chemistry and the other portion was uh, albumin printing and some problems there. I want to address the paper and the quality of the eggs and things like that. So if, if somebody, if you are in here and I don't know that you are, but if you're watching and you ask those questions, I said, I told you via email that I was going to address those today and I'm going to. So, uh, We'll let everybody get in here. We're only three minutes in yet, so we're uh, we got a we got a couple of uh, man. I, I was hoping I could get this streamed over to YouTube, but uh, it doesn't look like they're going to let me do that. So I'm going to have to upload it afterwards, I guess, because uh, it is live on Facebook though. So if you're on Facebook, welcome. You don't need to be in Zoom if you don't want to. This will be my last Zoom. Um, this will be my last Zoom meeting as well, too. So when you make a major change like this in your life, um, you end up having, uh, you have to address everything that you haven't addressed before. So um, consolidating my website, um, getting rid of all these external accounts that I'm not using. Uh, one of the emails this week asked, uh, asked, hey, is the Collodian, for actually two, I got two this week. Is the Clodian.com foreign forum board down? I, yes, it is. It's gone. Um, I don't know if it'll be back up in kind of a read-only mode. I was working with someone in Poland to do that. I haven't heard from him in a while. Um, <clears throat> but I do have the database. I do have the information. But I'm consolidating everything. The Clodian forum board, I've, I've talked a little bit about this before. Ever since social media like Facebook and Instagram and those kinds of things, people don't even really go to websites much. If they do, they just go there to uh, get a little information and they're gone. It, the, the big drive, as everyone knows, is social media, right? So Facebook, Instagram, um, whatever social media you end up um, hanging out on, that's kind of where the action is. So the forum boards, uh, what a 14, uh, I'm gonna guess I opened that in 2003-ish, somewhere in there, 2004 maybe, something like that. So there's a whole bunch of information on that database. I hate, I hated to take that down, but at the end of the day, when you're making a change like this in your life, <clears throat> I think it was like 300 bucks a year for me to keep that up. And I just, I just couldn't justify it. And I'm trying to clean house, trying to simplify, I'm trying to get everything consolidated. And, and if you've ever made a big move like this, you guys know what that's all about. So that's why the Collodian Forum, Collodian Forum Board is not up. Um, I don't, like I said, I don't know if it will be again, maybe some, sometime in the future I can address that. I gave all the database and all the files, the website, everything to a guy in Poland <clears throat> and said, if you want to make a standalone for this, you can. I own Collodian.com and I own wetplate.com and I have studioq.com. Those are the three main website or domains that I own. Um, I've offered this before. Um, I would be interested in, in selling wetplate.com and collodian.com. Collodian.com has got a tremendous amount of traffic. Um, I'm not really anxious to do that, but again, consolidating. What I'm going to do <clears throat> on the mountain where I'm moving, I'm going to offer retreats. Uh, one, maybe two retreats a year for one or maybe two people at a time, depending if it's a couple or a single person, to come up, spend a week on the mountain, work in photography, work in the dark room, printing, negatives, positives, whatever we want to do. I'll have a blacksmith shop set up. We can make knives. We can do basic blacksmithing, eat out of the greenhouse, hike, fish, and basically just digitally detox, right? That, so that's kind of the path moving forward. I'm going to go into kind of a, a semi, <laughs> semi retirement, if you will. I don't know if you want to call it that, but I'm going to go into, uh, hey, John, me first. You're, hey, you're welcome. Um, 2021 is, is our, our launch if we can do this. Um, but we're going we're gonna to have, you know, I want to go in kind of a semi retirement. I really, what I want to do is I want to live on the homestead with my wife, do a little bit of photography, do a little bit of blacksmith, bladesmith work, <clears throat> just re relax. And, and, and I hope the world doesn't crumble, but it surely seems like the future is not that bright for this country and maybe even the world. And I just kind of want to, 
extricate, kind of pull myself out of that and, and go up and live in some peace, have a little bit of freedom and privacy. But if everything goes right, we'll be inviting people up once, maybe twice a year, once in the beginning of the summer around this time, maybe a little later, and maybe at the end of the summer, depending on, on how things work and, and if whatever happens in the future. We don't even know. I've kind of slid those plans to the side a little bit as well. So those are the plans. And it would be really nice. We've written out a whole curriculum. We have a whole plan for it. Um, <clears throat> a place to stay in the studio. Um, peace and quiet. We're, we're, we're way up there in the Rockies. Um, um, just removed. We're on top of a mountain. We're removed from pretty much, well, we have a couple of neighbors around, right? Some mountain neighbors, but um, has a little bit of livestock, some chickens and maybe some goats. Um, we're all off the grid. So we have solar, we have a water well, we have our own on-site waste, our septic system. So we're completely unplugged from the world that way. Um, obviously we have phones and we'll have an internet connection, I think. But um, at the end of the day, that's the plan. And that's why I'm doing, making all these major changes. I've noticed, and I don't know about you guys, <clears throat> but in the last two months, I've seen a lot of photographers fold up in wet collodion, shut down shop, shut down their studio, um, quit, um, whatever. And I don't, in a lot of ways, I don't blame them in some, some sense of the word. If you're a portrait photographer, that's basically on hold. If you do any events, um, it started in April with me. Everything was canceled for me. All my university, college, demonstrations. Uh, I think I've said this before. I had a big gig with the National Park Service in um, uh, Scotts Bluff, Nebraska, that was canceled, the William Henry Jackson thing that I was going to do. Um, <clears throat> I do occasional portraits. I do a lot of uni and demo, uh, college demos. All of those were canceled. Everything was canceled. A private workshop was canceled. Everything was canceled. Kind of kind of bummed me out a little bit, of course, like everybody. Uh, definitely took income away from me, uh, obviously, like everybody. But at the end of the day, when I got thinking about this, this is a really critical moment that we're facing in, in the life of uh, like photography, wet plate especially, um, where if you're a portrait photographer or you do those kinds of events and you're with the public, that stuff is all off. So at the end of the day, what do you do? You kind of hang in limbo. People are making, you know, self portraits and doing things at home and doing still lives and trying to, you know, trying to stay up on the technical or trying to make interesting plates or interesting work. Um, but it's short lived. <clears throat> if you can't interact and you can't get out there and you can't do your thing. Um, <clears throat> my thing, I, I love teaching workshops. I always had workshops going on. Somebody knocking on the door, wanting to come in to do a private workshop. I haven't done group workshops for years, but one or two people at a time come in, spend two or three days here in the studio, work, work, in, the, work in the studio, work in the dark room, and, and learn about the process. And, and since we can't do that anymore, since I can't do portraits anymore, since I can't go to colleges or universities anymore, everything was shut off for me. Probably a good time for me because everything's packed up now, so I, I'm not doing that anyway. But it's changed people's approach in, in, like I said, I know two shops that, 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 that have shut down, wet clothing, doing portraits, and, and for obvious reasons. How can you pay overhead? How can you pay for all that when you don't have people coming in? Um, so it's, it's, it's changing. It's a changing landscape, no pun intended. Um, and, and it's gonna be interesting to see where this goes. Um, my personal opinion is, we may come back a little bit here in the summertime and things may kind of open up a little bit, but <clears throat> by fall time, everything will close back down. Everything will be, we'll be back down on lock, back in lockdown will be all that. So it's something to think about. It's, a, you know, so on the positive side though, it's been really great for me because I was able to do a bunch of oil prints. I was able to do things that I just haven't had the time to do that I couldn't justify doing. So without leaving home a lot other than going to the grocery store or whatever, um, I got to spend a lot of time down here. And now in the last month, you know, or a few weeks anyway, all we've been doing is packing boxes and getting ready to move. So not a terrible time for me necessarily, financially, maybe not, not the greatest, but um, <clears throat> as far as carving out time to do other things that you'd normally be getting prepped for a workshop, doing demos, doing, you know, interview, doing whatever it is. I have done a couple of interviews um, over the last couple of weeks too. Um, but the, the interesting thing about it is 
is you know is the glass half full or half empty i guess it depends on what you how you look at it um but at the end of the day if you're a portrait photographer and you're in this lockdown mode you're not having people come over and people aren't going to be coming over you know coming into your studio i mean maybe a couple but most people are still going to be a little bit fearful of what's going on so enough of that it's just interesting to see where everybody's at and what they're doing um and i i want to address a, a couple of the questions that i had so the clothing.com forum board, if that does come back up if sometime in the future, I'll definitely announce that. People will know that. Um, I may be on the mountain up there. I may be doing some live shows on what I'm building and what I'm doing. Um, you'll see my studio go up. You'll see my warehouse and my shop go up. We're doing a, a 30 by 80 by 12 foot uh, metal or steel building. And I'm splitting that in half. Half will be my home and half will be my studio and shop and and garage kind of affair and um and like i said we're, we're in a very remote we have 12 acres in the rocky mountains in central western colorado in the u.s here so we're in a very remote location a beautiful location it looks like a, a national park up there we have big beautiful rock outcroppings um it's the gateway the ute tribe the native american ute tribe called that red mother earth and colorado you know is is is, is a basically a spanish word you know the color uh, red color basically or, or uh, I can't remember the exact translation but um, there's a bunch of uh, uh, red out red outcroppings and pink granite in the ground and, and you know it's the Rocky Mountains so we have a lot of rocks but big beautiful red rock outcroppings there's some places near the village a little town called Florissant which is about 15 miles um, from me about 20 kilometers 22 kilometers from me that have these big, beautiful rock outcroppings. It would be, I've always wanted to photograph those. I'll, I'll, I'll eventually get over there and make some negatives and maybe do a little project on, on landscape over the next couple of years when I'm up there, just to get to know the land better and that kind of thing. But we're going to have a good time up there. And so keep, keep, in, keep that in mind. And I, like I said, I may do some, some uh, videos on that stuff just to, just to keep people abreast and know that, it, that I haven't died, that I haven't fallen off the earth, and uh, uh, you'll hear no more, no more from me. You will. It's just, uh, just going to be a matter of uh, time, you know. Uh, nobody will miss me that much, but uh, you guys will all know where, where I'm at and what I'm doing. So let's talk about the first... Um, question that I had this week and and you guys jump in I, I got the chat open over here you guys jump in at any time and um, we'll uh, we'll address this if you have any questions the first one I want to address is um, oh god let me remember his name too I should have written these down but I just had them in my mind Samuel in Germany I believe Samuel so if you're watching Samuel this is for you buddy um, let's talk about iodizer and what that is and what that means so when we make, uh, you guys see that? Yeah. When we make um, iodizer, what are we doing? Um, I, I talked about this before. I stole this from um, a, a Kodak book from the 20s, uh, 20s and 30s. It was published a few times on making wet clothing negatives. And Kodak sold uh, iodizer. So what they did is they split um, iodizer and collodion they split they, this is collodion this is iodizer so they split them up in two different bottles and when you're ready to make images you made you mix those together and you had what what they called salted collodion okay so that's the basis of an iodizer you separate the salts and the solvents that's what's over here salts and solvents i hear myself echoing out of the dark room back there it's kind of funny and this is the plain USP collodion. So nothing mixed in there. That's, that's our, our separation. So when we make this, the salts and solvents, we call that an iodizer. And the plain USP collodion mixed together makes salt, plain, uh, salted collodion. So that's ready to use photographic um, material or compound, right? Um, why do we do that or why would we be interested in doing that? Um, I've argued for many years that this is the, uh, we talked a little bit last week about safety mitigation. This is a great way to mitigate your ether, to take that uh, uh, formation of peroxide, which is very rare, but the formation of peroxide away by mixing your salts and solvents together. The alcohol is a great stabilizer for ether. Um, 
So you stabilize your ether. And then on top of that, you don't have to commit large quantities. So people make up a, a great big, you know, 500 mils of, of mixed collodion. And they have these great plans. They're going to make all these photographs this month. And they end up making a couple of plates. And then, you know, they have a family, something or another. And then they were busy working. And the next thing you know, it's three months later. And they go back and their 500 mils of collodion is blood red, right? They're just completely uh, negative only, outdoor negative only collodion. And so what this does is it helps you control how much you want to mix up and use. So you can do quantities as, you know, 20 mils, right? You can mix up 200 mils, 100 mils, 50 mils, whatever you think you're gonna use. So you don't commit because the shelf life of the iodizer is um, decades, let's say. And I would be safe to say that because, uh, oh, I was gonna show you. I. I I got to show you this book um, and I didn't have it out. I'll go grab it off my bookshelf. I'm packing my books today. That's what I, that's what I remembered it. Um, so make mixing iodizer. And if you have my book, it's in there. It's easy to do. Basically, you're just taking your salts and your solvents and putting them together. So you take your iodides, your bromides, your alcohol and your ether, you mix that together. That's an iodizer. Shelf life is good to go. Many, many, a long, long time. Then when you're ready to make photographs, you mix collodion with that iodizer, and now you have a full working uh, collodion or salted collodion ready to pour on a plate and make, make a photograph. So here's the question this week from Samuel. He ordered his NH4I, and if you don't know what that is, that's ammonium iodide, right? So here's the iodide portion. Here's the ammonium portion broken down. And he ordered his CDBR, or I don't know if it was CDBR, but it's some bromide. This happens to be cadmium bromide. So these are the salts. And the functions of the salts I've talked about before, um, we're mostly interested in the iodide. What are the bromides doing? There's some stabilization for the collodion. This, this happens to be a cadmium. This is a heavy metal. Uh, the bromide function of it kind of responsible for the half tints, especially in like nature greens and some of the yellows. Uh, you can read in the old literature kind of what they suspected it was for, but um, it, you, you want a bromide in there for a little more um, uh, value, for a little more range as, as it were. Um, we're mostly interested, this is what I'm gonna talk about, is I'm gonna talk about the ammonium iodide today, or this right now. Uh, the ammonium iodide, so, so that's kind of the function of the bromides, kind of half tints, half tones in certain colors. And the iodides for speed and contrast. So we use these words and they're kind of funky and it's kind of different, but um, um, speed and contrast, what we're talking about is the ISO and the tonal range you get. And I showed you a few times on page 53 in my book, those, that illustration of the color, the slightly iodized, the highly iodized, the different colors, that affects your speed and contrast. Michelle asks, does it make a difference if we soak or not the paper before we coat it with gelatin? Oh, I'll get to that, Michelle. I'll, I'll, I'll get to the, that in just a second here. Um, so the ammonium iodide, <clears throat> speed, and I really want to put that in quotes, and more so contrast. And some people would interchange these two words a little bit too. Um, but when we mix the ammonium iodide or any iodide, uh, potassium iodide is not soluble in the solvent. So you're going to have the precipitate, right? Fall out. You get that layer of white on the bottom of your bottle. Your collodion will probably stay cloudy for a day or a week or depending on your environment before it clears and everything comes out. That's potassium iodide. It's not soluble in the solvents. And one of the reasons I use, two, two reasons I use NH4I or ammonium iodide is this. <clears throat> one, it's soluble in the solvents, meaning you don't have the cloudy, you don't have the precipitate, right? And two, or moreover, um, it breaks down or oxidizes faster. I mean, I'm just going to say break down. It's really oxide, oxidation. <clears throat> and what do we mean by that when we say break down? What we mean is the iodide goes into the solution, the collodion, the ether, and the alcohol, the nitrocellulose, ether, and alcohol. Then you have the other salt or salts in there. What happens is that interaction, that oxidation, starts breaking down the iodide. 
meaning um, the iodide exposed to air, exposed to other compounds, will break down. And when you expose it to oxygen or these other compounds, and it's soluble in the, in the solvents, when you expose it like that, it breaks down and turns, basically, turns into iodine. And what color is iodine? Iodine is normally red, right? So that's why you get this color shift, as the iodides break down into iodine, and then the iodine mixes with AgNO3, what do you get? You get AgI, or silver iodide. That's kind of the process of that, okay? So if you understand this, and the two things that will break iodides down fast are heat and light, or either combination of either one of those. So if you have a very fresh 20 grams, 50 grams, whatever you buy it in, of NH4I or ammonium iodide, if it's very fresh, really bright white, sealed up nice, it may take two days before you see a real color shift in it. And if you keep it in a cooler in the dark, it may take a week before you see that start starting to break down, right? So if your NH4I is oxidated, meaning it's turned yellow, you open your little plastic bag and it's yellow or your, your, your can is yellow, that means the oxygen has got, gotten to it and it started breaking down in the powder form. You use that in your collodion, that'll go woo, right off. It's already broken down. Once you get that in your collodion, you're gonna go orange or even red. But what happens, there's a, there's a breakdown and an uptake. So what happens is you'll see you'll mix this in your bottle uh, let's say this is old, oxidized NH4I, it turns red and says, oh my God, my stuff is red right away. And I always say, I get these emails all the time, I say, set it aside, give it a day or two. It's gonna flip back around and uptake some of that iodide and go back to a nice yellow color. And that's what you want. So it, it releases, absorbs, releases, absorbs. What Samuel had happen this week, and I couldn't ever verify this because he's in Germany and I'm here, it sounded like he had some super, super fresh iodizer, and, and if it was, or iodides, and if it was ammonium nitrate, it, it, it acted like cadmium iodide. And if you guys know about cadmium iodide, CDI, cadmium iodide, that stuff never breaks down. In fact, the old literature says, make some collodion with cadmium, use cadmium as your iodide, and maybe you use cadmium bromide as your bro, uh, bromide. Um, your, uh, this iodide, this cadmium iodide is so stable, your, your stuff will look like water for years. It'll never break down, it, it very, very, very slowly. So we want the opposite of that. We wanna break this stuff down fast. What he did is he mixed his stuff up, it stayed clear, it stayed clear, it stayed clear, it wouldn't change at all. Uh, and then he had a slight color shift in it, you know, three, four days in, and then the next day it shifted back to almost this clear straw, green, yellow, like he first mixed with fresh iodide. <clears throat> and I said, what, what's the CAS number on that NH4I? Tell me what that is. And he bought it from some supplier in Europe that sells the raw chemistry, and he claims it was good. I never got the CAS number. I said, wow, this, this is acting like it's not breaking down. It's not oxidizing. It's not changing colors. Why do you want that change in color? Is you want that tonal range. And when that iodide is still wrapped up like that, your plates are going to look like crap. They're going to look like hell. They're going to be white and nasty. And, and it, it, it's because you need that range. You need that contrast. That's what iodides break down into. And you get that tonal range. So if you have that locked up and it's not breaking down, that's why when you first mix collodion and you pour a plate and it's still really light color, you won't get that range. You'll get kind of a flat, lack of contrast image. It's, it's not that great. That's because those are still locked up in there. So you give it a day or two, you put it in some light, you put it with some heat, whatever, and it breaks it down. You get that nice orange color, that yellow orange, whatever you like, right? It has to have some iodine in there to make silver iodide halogen right to, to, for proper for that good contrast that we like his wasn't doing that and I said look get some get a tincture of iodine put a couple of drops in it so he did that he put a couple of drops of tincture of iodine in it went a beautiful orange color 
uh, you can read about this, and, and it's even in my book, I believe, too. Um, they used to they used to hype jazz that up. They'd make collodion, and they'd add a little bit of iodide, either Ki, NH4I, raw, or they'd add uh, uh, usually a tincture of iodine, straight iodine into that. That ripens it quickly, fast. It ripens that collodion up. But we call it ripen to use it for that tonal range. His wasn't doing that. So it's important to understand if you don't have that color shift, and that color shift's real important, that's why I talk about storing your collodion in clear bottles. If you store them in amber bottles, you never really know what color it is. Um, and if you pour on black plates, you can't see that. If you pour on clear plates, you'll have a pretty good idea what color it is, but um, store it in clear bottles and it'll keep you informed of what color, where you're at in that slightly iodized range, a light color or heavy, heavily iodized um, collodion. When you get to the more heavy, heavier iodized collodion, that's when you're moving into kind of the negative territory. That's where it's going to be really slow in speed, 0 0.5, 0 0.25, very, very high in contrast. And uh, you want, for positives, you want that kind of middle range, that yellow-orange color, that beautiful, everybody knows when you hit it. Everybody knows it produces the chemistry spot on. It produces great images, great tonal range. Um, all of that. I don't see that very often online anymore. I don't see that wonderful range and maybe people aren't after that. I'm just talking textbook kind of stuff. Um, but that's what gives you that is the color of your eye, uh, the color of your collodion and the breakdown of the iodides. <clears throat> that's what gives you that. So for Samuel, when that's not happening, you can treat it with a tincture of iodine and speed that up or you can put it in heat and light and speed that breakdown up. When it's not broken down, you're gonna have flat images. You're not gonna have a good transfer. Remember that double decomposition we talked about a lot. <clears throat> you're not gonna have that happen as well and as efficiently. And you're not gonna have that wonderful, you know, that, that tonal range. That's what collodion is about, right? Especially ambrotypes, that's, that's what it's all about. So it's not the hokey pokey. It's, it's, about, it's about the color of your iodide and the tonal range. That's what we're after. So <clears throat> that's the iodizer. And if that makes sense, I hope it does. In the nutshell, be sure you know what color your, your collodion is so you're producing the proper tone range in your images. Now, <clears throat> a lot of people say, I want speed. So they mix it and it's a light yellow straw, green, yellow-ish color, light yellow color. And they're at ISO 3 or ISO 2. Uh, and they use Ki, they use potassium iodide. So the shelf life is a lot longer. It's not soluble. The potassium, the Ki, the Ki is not soluble in the solvents. So it takes a long time to break, longer time to break that down to get an orange or a yellow color out of that. But your, your ISO will stay a little higher, maybe two or three, where you break down into a, a, an orange yellow color, your ISO is probably around one. You know, and I'm, I'm just guessing. But, and then on top of the KI, with the KI, you also have the precipitant, the fallout of that. You got to clean your bottles. You got to do all that stuff. It takes longer for it to clear. Although you can use the cloudy stuff if you want. But I just found for me, I primarily make negatives now anyway. And that's what you want is the ammonium iodide or the NH4I for negatives. But I found for me even positives. I love the contrast. I love the tonal range. I love that. I don't like flat images. I, I don't like them, either positive and especially negatives. We want that contrast. We want that density. We want all the, that whole full range of, of, of what we can get in what collodion. And that's primarily based on the iodide. So remember that. Iodizer, mixing your salts and your solvents together um, and using that as, uh, what I better let some people in here um, using that as a as a guideline and it's really important as a guideline to say um, I know where my if I'm slightly iodized if I'm highly iodized I know what kind of image I want to make it's all about kind of categorizing these things and understanding how the chemistry works understanding what kind of images you want to make and and then balancing all of that out that's that's really what we're doing we're just kind of balancing everything out and trying to get to the point where we can um really make uh, quality images or let, let me be more subjective um making images that we feel 
um, suit our our goal or our ambitions with the process. And if you just kind of if you just kind of out there messing around and tinkering around, it's a good way to learn. But if you're not taking notes and if you don't understand a little bit of chemistry and how these processes work, how these compounds mixed together work, uh, you're going to be on a very very long journey of trying to figure out how it um, how it applies to what you want to do. Uh, you've got to be a meticulous note taker and you've got to have uh, uh, a lot of stamina and a lot of money and time, to be honest. That's one of the reasons I do these things and publish books and have for many years is, <clears throat> is I've tried to do the research and I've tried to, and I, I, sp I started with artists, right? When I first got into this, they're, they're, all they're all really most, for mo the most part, people were working in this were, what collodion uh, reenact civil war american civil war reenactors that's who that's basically who was using this process and um i got started in it to uh I started publishing in the collodion.com forum board that we talked about a minute ago i did all that to for artists to come in and say hey i want to use this for my you know personal work i want to use this to explore this or that or whatever so it wasn't about was plywood authentic in 1867 or what kind of buttons were on the end. It wasn't anything about that. It was, it was more about how do I use this process for the things I want to say? And is this process, back then it was, is this proce process even feasible to do? <clears throat> so I got into it uh, to, to help and to have, really to have communication with other artists that wanted to work in the process that we could exchange ideas and throw ideas back and forth and experiment and find out what worked and what didn't. And, uh, uh, without all the restrictions on, you know, Civil War reenactment photography, we didn't want, I, I wasn't involved in that. I had, you know, there was, it's interesting history for sure, but <clears throat> I wasn't using this process for that, those reasons. So, and then in 2006, I published that first book, um, The Wet Plate Collodion Experience, uh, for, during my graduate degree. Um, I had 70% creative and 30% technical. So I used that portion of my graduate degree to write that first book and um, I learned a whole lot since then, by the way. So it's ever evolving and ever changing uh, kind of thing. So that is kind of the gist of why you'd want to know these things, how they're useful for you in the long run to understand for you working in the process to know what you want. You may not want the contrast. You may not want this or that or what I'm talking about. You may want the opposite you'll still have that knowledge on how to get the opposite of that, right? I see all the time on, <clears throat> on not all the time, because I'm not on there all the time, but on social media, I see people posting photographs and look at this, you know, it'll be a sweep or it'll be a, um, you know, what we used to call fire, the restrainer, um, not flowing, the developer not flowing right and giving interesting marks or bubbles or lines or whatever it is. And they, they find it fascinating and interesting. And people say, how did you do that? I don't know. I just, it just happened. You know, <clears throat> it's kind of funny in my mind. I think if you understood the process, you'd know how to re replicate that. If you wanted to do that in your work, you could replicate that. You could make artifacts. You can make islands and sweeps and bubbles and it's technique and chemistry based. And it, once you understand that, you can either do really clean, super nice plates, or you can put artifacts on them, right? That's, that's the whole idea behind this. But you have to understand both the technique and moreover, even the chemistry, and because that affects the technique, right? So <clears throat> that's, that was my kind of, uh, um, what, what do we say, my kind of uh, reasoning to get in to uh, publishing or writing and teaching and explaining what I've done in the process. I'm not an organic chemist. I'm not a, you know, I'm none of that. I'm a guy that used this process to tell stories with photographs with, and I wanted a certain look and feel. I wanted the materials um, to understand those, to talk about those in my work, how they support my work. Um, you know, I love the historical part of it that does play into my work, not the Civil War stuff, but Native American, an abandoned process, a forgotten process. Uh, the history of photography is fascinating to me. I love it. So all of those reasons play a role. And I think if people dive into it a little more and, and um, spend a little more time and energy on uh, uh, learning about the chemistry, learning about the history, learning about the techniques, go read all the primary literature. Google Books has everything. 
right? If you can, if you can read that 19th century English and deduce what drachmas and, and, and you know, all the different measurements are for, for recipes and things, you'll learn a lot. I'll tell you one thing though, I have read the majority of that literature and there are things in some of those recipes that are published to throw you off. There are things that are wrong in those recipes that will screw your whole process up. So it wasn't uncommon for him to do that um, back in the day. And, um, and it still kind of happens in Europe. I lived in Europe for a few years and I know that not everyone is honest about teaching certain things on the process there. So um, most are, most are, but that's kind of the gist of that. So learn the process, learn the chemistry, learn the techniques and make them serve your work. Don't be a process photographer, turn that around and make the process serve what you want to do, right? Don't be a slave to the process, have the process slave, be a slave to your work, right? Just like money. We don't want to be a slave to money. We want money to support, you know, we want money to be our slave kind of thing, if you will. It's kind of probably a bad analogy, but um, don't be um, caught up in the process so much that that's all you do, um, basically is what I'm saying. I, that's my opinion anyway. So number two, if I remember correctly, this gentleman's name is Paul, and he asked about albumin, albumin prints. Um, I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail with these because you can really run down rabbit holes with this stuff. Last week, we talked a little bit about the fading, um, especially the yellowing, the yellowing. And uh, fading and yellowing is two different things, but they kind of go hand in hand. The yellowing is the biggest problem with albumin prints. Um, you can read all that old literature. It talks about yellowing and what it is. It's a tiny amount of silver in the highlights in the, in the, in the paper parts, the clear parts, the, um, um, where you have the most silver on the negative, no light penetrates and you have a highlight on your paper, right? It's, it's retained silver in there. That's what basically, uh, so it doesn't necessarily go black, but it, it definitely turns yellow. I showed you one of mine last week that's uh, might be 12 or 15 years old. It's, uh, it's kaput, as they say already. So it didn't, it didn't last very long, is, is what I'm saying. So last week we talked a little bit about this, but Paul's question was, he showed me a couple of details on prints and what he had, he had some lines in the print. And he also had some, they looked like spots. They had dark spots, maybe some half light spots. Um, and I wanted to address those two things. And the first thing I want to address is the type of paper you use. And it's, it's really critical, especially for albumin paper, because what we're talking about with albumin paper is we're talking about a thin layer of egg white that rides on top of the paper, literally. I mean, that's what you want. Kind of think of it as um, a glass plate making a positive image and you're pouring collodion on that. That's, you want that thin. What you're talking about is you want separation from the paper and the egg white. You don't want the egg white going into the paper, okay? Yeah, so, Hot pressed, hot, hot pressed papers, really hard surface papers are good. That's why I recommend Crowbar in, in my book, um, in, um, in the literature that I write about making albumin prints, I talk about Crowbar. There's a, a couple of Strath, Strathmore papers that are okay. Um, but what you don't want is you don't want the material soaking into the paper. Like the worst paper you can use, it would be like an Arches Plantain or something like that, right? 300 gram, you know, rag paper that just stuff just soaks into. And that's why, um, that's why salt prints are a little soft is because that silver, that material, um, even the gelatin soaks down in to the paper a little bit. Here you want complete separation. So little model marks as they call them in the 19th centuries or different densities could be two things. It's primarily probably your paper. And then if you have anything on the backside, you don't want any, any sensitizer on the backside of that. You'll get marks, you'll, get, you'll have problems like that constantly. So those kind of model marks and different densities 
um, probably primarily due to the type of paper you're using. And you'll have to play with the papers. The hot roll, the hard surfaces are the best. Um, you see how I do it. I float them on, a, on, on an albumin uh, with a mirror under it. I can see I don't have any bubbles. Pull them up, turn them, hang them, pull them up for a minute, unfurl them, turn them, and hang them. And that comes to my second part is this. That can happen in, in really primarily in the egg white application, in the albuminizing of the paper. Why you get these wiggle marks or these little different um, ridges on it is because you have heavy albumin going down, kind of drying and creating a ridge. And then when you sensitize it on the silver bath, that ridge is gonna show, that, that kind of float is gonna show. That can be two things, your technique of how you're doing it. And like I said, I twist my paper for a minute, I pull it up, unfurl it, turn it. So we get not only an even coating, but we get rid of these kind of squiggle lines. Secondly is the quality of the egg white. I've seen this quite a bit with um, powdered egg whites, people that buy the powdered egg white and make albumin. I see this more often. Secondly, low quality eggs, like quite store-bought and, you know, supermarket, you know, a buck and a half, a dozen eggs, really low quality. Hens that are chickens that are eating really low quality food, producing just, just low quality egg whites, right? I mean, in a perfect world, you'd want to go out to your chicken coop and grab you a dozen eggs and make your fresh albumin straight away with those eggs. That would be a perfect world, right? We can't all do that. A lot of us don't have access to those. But if you can get good organic eggs or clean, rain, uh, uh, free range chickens, that, that helps tremendously, the quality, everything. Probably the lowest quality are those store-bought, cheap store-bought white eggs. And I'm not a big fan of the powdered albumin either, um, the kind of the processed stuff. Um, don't see good results there. But at the end of the day, your paper and your eggs, um, make sure they're in line with kind of the, the 19th century. I was just reading the other day, and I, I did a show, I, did, I was in Dresden, I, I showed some photographs in, in a museum there and did a, did a whole kind of dog and pony show as we say here. Um, in Dresden, Germany. And Dresden was the epicenter of albumin paper. And they went through tens of thousands of eggs a year, right? And they were all women floating these big sheets and making big reams of albumin paper. And there's not a scratch of that left in Dresden. And when I was there, I asked about it. <clears throat> and you can read about the history of albumin. It's, it's fascinating uh, how many eggs they went through and all the Becker eyes, all the, all the bakeries making these, you know, Egg, egg yolk induced kind of uh, dishes, that kind of thing, um, because there's so many, so many eggs being used, right? And I was thinking when I was there, wouldn't it have been neat to find someone that has some an original sheet of that albumin made back in the day? God, what, what, what I'd give to be able to float a sheet of that and make a print on, wouldn't that be neat? I, I, I don't know, I trip about that. But like I said last week, I've kind of gotten away from albumin. I gave you those reasons why, the salt prints and the albumin prints. Um, that's just my personal feelings, nothing, they're fine, they're great, they're beautiful, I love them, all that stuff, but just my personal work, you know, I talk a lot about, you know, customizing your processes, the variants you want to use, the type of prints you want to make to your work and, and having reasons for that. And if you like albumin, you can do it right, you can, you know, uh, if you have the water supply and you have, you know, you're, you're okay morally with all those issues and questions and you do it right, they're absolutely stunning, obviously. But I will forewarn that you can read all the literature and they talk about the, the longevity of them, even in the best case scenario is quite short. The archivability for a perfect print is quite short. And uh, so those are the questions on uh, this week on albumin and iodizer. I'll put my little board away here. And let's go into, uh, well, maybe, maybe I'll use it. Let's go into Michelle's question here. Michelle, does it make a difference if you soak the, okay. So he, he's asking, he's talking about gelatin chloride. Um, oh, and Kareem just posted something there. Um, what'd you post there? Um, he's talking about gelatin chloride and having um, uh, soaking paper. 
And let, let me talk about that for just a second, because that's a good, uh, it's a good segue to, to talking about prints. Yes. Oh, you're talking about Rollins Oil. Okay. Okay. So gel oil. Okay. Rollins Oil printing. Oh, there you go. Cream just put, that's a, you guys look in the chat. Um, he just posted um, a, a paper on albumin prints, a summary of new re research about their preservation. Very good. Very good. Thank you for doing that. Um, I don't have, um, I can barely keep my computer up here sometimes. <laughs> um, so yes, so, so Michelle is talking about Rollins oil printing. And you saw, if you haven't seen the whole segment that I did on that, I did several videos on making Rollins oil prints. In short, they're paper covered with gelatin, dichromates put on that gelatin to sensitize them, making, putting the negative, exposing in UV light, washing the dichromate from that gelatin, swelling that gelatin with water, and then rolling a lithographic ink over that relief or that matrix is what it's called. The highlights swell up because the, the, the UV light couldn't get to the gelatin. The shadow areas are flattened. It hardens the gelatin in the shadow areas. The oil rejects on the highlights and takes to the shadows. That gives you the highlights and the, and the, and the um, uh, shadow areas. Um, so Michelle is asking a very important question, and I talk about this quite a bit. Um, he's asking when you have your paper and, and oil print, Rollins oil prints, and, and we need to say that it's Rollins oil prints because people get them confused with brome oil and other things. Rollins oil prints have a very wide latitude on paper. And why that is is because you're putting – a layer of gelatin on the paper, uh, very thick. This is, a, I use an 8% solution. And for a 15 centimeter square, I use about 20 milliliters of that 8% gelatin. And that gives me about a millimeter and a half when it's wet. I use magnets to strip it off, pour it on, let it harden and then take the magnets off. That gives me about a millimeter and a half thick of gelatin. Of course it dries flat but there's a lot of gelatin there. So it's separating it a lot from the paper, right? So really what you're working with when you ink is gelatin, whether it's swollen or hardened, it's still above the paper. We just talked about the albumin. We want things above the paper. We don't want to soak down into the paper. The quality you get with the oil prints are a little different because you're rolling them out and using other techniques. They're very pictorialist, but so he's asking, should we wet this paper before we pour the uh, gelatin on? And the answer is absolutely yes. For example, if I take a piece of Hannah Mule, I like Hannah Mule, I like, my favorite's probably Hannah Mule and Archer's Plantine for, for uh, oil, Rollins oil printing. I'll cut up sheets of that and I'll do like an um, 20 centimeter, 20 centimeter for a 15 centimeter, um, square negative or image, I'll cut that up and I'll go in the dark room and I'll fill a pan of water up with, you know, 20 degrees Celsius water or so, 22 degrees, 68 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit. And I'll put that paper in and I'll put my little rocks on the corner to make sure it stays under the water because paper floats and we don't want dry areas. I'll just let that soak in that paper for five minutes, 10 minutes. I don't care how long, five or 10 minutes, something like that. Um, after that soaked, uh, why, why do I soak that paper? When you think about the paper, you think about this is fiber-based, um, acid-free paper. And if you, if you were to blow it up, you'd see all, all the fibers of the paper. Those are stiff when it's dry, right? So when you wet it, it loosens up and it's flexible. If you take a dry piece of paper and put it on your magnetic stand and strip it out and pour oil, I mean, gelatin, I always say that. If you pour gelatin on it, melted gelatin, now you're wetting certain parts of it and you're gonna get humps. You, your paper's gonna swell up and go down, swell up and go down. So you get this lumpy loo. You're gonna have big concentrated pockets of gelatin and then a hump with no gelatin. So it's really important to wet that, relax those fibers so when you go put it down on your stand to pour your gelatin on it, you don't get that lumpy stuff. And if you get that lumpy stuff, even after you've wetted the paper or soaked the paper, soak it longer. You haven't, you haven't relaxed all those fibers enough. Does that make sense? I hope it does. 
It's really important. That's one step um, I don't see people talk a lot about um, when they're talking about um, Rollins oil printing. Really important to do that. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's Rollins oil printing. Wet that paper, baby. Wet it, <laughs> wet it good. Um, where am I here? So what else do we have? Um, I listened, Quinn said for a long time, over a year. I don't know what, uh, I don't know. I was just looking at uh, Facebook there. I'm about a 10 second delay on that. It's kind of interesting. Um, thanks, I asked because I saw somebody do it on YouTube. Yeah, Michelle, you, th that's, that's good. Yeah, they, they did it right then, so that's good. Can you share the PowerPoint you use during the oil? Um, yes, I can. I, I will find that. Uh, reminder, I can send it to you. Um, that's a keynote, but if you have, it's the same thing. Um, PowerPoint that I used, I do have that. Um, and I hope, I hope I said in there that, uh, that I uh, wet that paper. I think I did. Yeah, I'll find that and I'll share it with you. So, um, admit, okay. What else do we have, guys? Do we have any other, th anything else we wanna kind of bat around or talk about a little bit? I'll move this out of the way. I know I'm, I'm like addicted to that board because I, I have to, I don't know. I know I'm not the greatest illustrator, but I have to get it out there. Um, what do we have? Any questions? General, let's just open it up. Anything you want to talk about? Anything you want to share? Anything? Um, all right. Look at us. Look at that view. That's a nice, that's a good looking group of people right there. Tell you what, you take that guy out of the center there. That's pretty good. <clears throat> so we have uh, a couple of um, um, big kind of, uh, how do we say it? Uh, I, not questions, but like commentary, like people and their the, the way they like to think about how they make images uh, or how they, uh, oh, oh, that's what, let me go grab, I damn near forgot. I want to show you guys this. Yes, Jan, uh, how long can you store iodizer? You know what, you make a bottle of iodizer today, Jan, and you and I will be both dead in the ground before it's bad. I guarantee you that. A very, very long time, seriously, decades. And it's a great segue. I had a conversation with a man called Joel Snyder years ago. He teaches photography at the University of Chicago, I believe. I believe it's the University of Chicago. Never heard of him before. Let me go grab a book. I, I'm, I'm packing my bookshelf today. Let me go grab a book. I want to show you guys this. You, you guys will love it. I remember page 73. And I set this aside specifically for this show because, uh, let me see if I can get, uh, I set this aside specifically for this show. It's um, uh, Light and Film, Time Life Books, the old Kodak books. And if you have this book, which I hope you do because it's really cool, um, one of the first things I saw was, was that old boy with his 20 by 24 camera out there making landscapes in the West. Uh, that's William Henry Jackson, by the way. Um, if you have it, you open to page 73. And what do you see? You see this. I posted this on the forum a long, long time ago. This is Joel Snyder in 1969 making wet clothing image. Yes, sir. Look at John. Look at John. Awesome. I love it. I love it. I absolutely love it. This is Joel Snyder making uh, wet clothing images in 1969. Actually, I think he started in 1967. Um, and why I had a conversation with uh, Joel was that there's this big kind of argument, uh, not necessarily in a bad way, but kind of people poking around who was the first, people claiming that they were the first to do this and the first to do that kind of thing, right? And that's okay. I mean, to, to a certain extent, I guess it depends on how far you take it. Um, but the reason I had a conversation with Joel was uh, this argument 
And somebody turned me on to him and I started doing research and I said, wait a minute, I have that book. Let me look in that book. And there he was making wet clothing positives and negatives. And I contacted him, a really nice guy. And he, I said, man, I've never heard of you before. It's kind of weird. And you were making, you were working in wet clothing in the sixties. He said, yeah, well, you know, I said, do, do, does that, I mean, I've never heard of you. Not that I'm anybody either, but I'm just saying I, I worked in this a long time and I, you know, uh, you know, I, everybody's kind of poking around and making these claims about the historical concept. When did it come back? Uh, a book uh, came out around that time. I think the antiquarian avant-garde um, people making claims in that book and things, just, just all kinds of stuff. Right. There was a lot of hubbub about it. And, he had Joel was like, I don't care. <laughs> you know, he was like, really cool. I, man, that's fine. I don't care. And he, we got talking and, and he said, yeah, I made a whole body of work. Yeah, I think he said 1967, 68, 67. I made a whole body of work, positives, ambrotypes, negatives, uh, prints, albumin prints for the Smithsonian. I think it, it was shown in between 67 and 69, somewhere in there. He did daguerreotypes. He did all that stuff. And, uh, and uh, he, he did it for the, the light and film book there. And, and Smithsonian took it. And I said, wow, that's fascinating. And we got talking and he said, uh, he said, in fact, I have a, I, Jan, listen to this. I have a bottle of iodizer from 1953 sitting on my shelf right here, clothing iodizer. I said, you think? He said yeah. I, I said, you think it's good? He said, I, I could almost guarantee you I could mix it with some plain USP clothing and it'd be fine. So that tells you kind of the shelf life, but that's, that's, uh, I just, you know, I loved it. When I discovered that, I think I photographed this and posted it on the Clodian forum, you know, a decade ago or whatever, but um, it was a great conversation. And again, I'm not hung up on who did what first or any of that stuff, but I do like the history. I do like to know the factual accounts of history, right? Like, and, and Joel was just very nonchalant and very, hey, yeah, I did this in the 60s. And he did a very good job. You see him making the portrait of the guy there in the train. And uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it was a fascinating conversation anyway. So a little bit of history for you and a little bit of uh, iodizer shelf life thrown in there. So if, if anybody knows about that, he does. Um, so uh, Jessica has a uh, question for everyone. I'm looking to build my own large format eight by 10 camera. Anybody have any tips or hints for her? This is kind of uh, out of my bailiwick. Anybody wanna jump in there and give her some tips and hints or? I, uh, I, built, I built box cameras before and I built uh, pinholes and I've done all kinds of stuff, but I don't, uh, I've never built cameras. I've always purchased them. So um, anybody have any tips for Jessica? Other than buy one? <laughs> she wants to build it. You know what? I have, uh, the, what's a Ty Gilroy is his name. Uh, have you searched him? Look up Ty Gilroy. Maybe somebody, Kareem's really good at this. Maybe he can post a link there in the chat. Ty Gilroy has a book on building cameras. I think that would be a good, uh, a good book. He sells, oh, he sells a nice PDF. Good. Well, there you go. There, there it is. So um, that's, a, that's a good one to, to go for. Do Ty Gilroy and uh, make your own um, make your own camera. Let me grab one more book here. I want to. I may have another one for you. Let me see. I, uh, this, is, this is a book, and I'm right about this. This is another good book. Uh, this is how I learned how to make callotypes. People think I don't buy other people's books. I do. I buy a lot of books. You should see my bookshelf. Get this book. This is a great book. Primitive Photography, a guide uh, to, uh, to making cameras, lenses, and callotypes. I use it for the callotype portion. Um, but it's the Alan Green is the author. Um, and he's got, and if you want to learn how to make calotypes, this is how I learned how to make calotypes. It's a great book. Um, I don't know what year it was published, but yeah, he's got, he's got some really good stuff in here too. So yeah, I didn't, I, I just realized that I only think about this book as calotypes, but it's a good book for, 
Um, thank you, Karen. That's a, that's a great link. I only think about it in the book for callow types. So paper negatives, they're the most difficult process. If you want something super challenging, make some paper negatives. Remember, we talked a little bit about 1839. Um, um, yeah, it makes you, you make your own primitive lens as well, too. That's right. That's in there, too. Remember, in 1839, we had basically uh, two types of photography. We had the paper negatives, Talbot, right? And we had the daguerreotypes, Louis Daguerre. One was a sharp, one-off, silver-coated copper plate. And the other one was a kind of a soft paper negative that you printed through the fiber of the paper, kind of soft and pictorialist. Um, you had, those are the two choices you had. You had one reproducible and one, one reproducible that was soft and fuzzy kind of, and one sharp off daguerreotype. So along comes collodion and kind of solves both of those problems. I always find that fascinating. It's important, it's an important part uh, in history to say, um, how did, why did collodion hang on? And then you can even extrapolate and go further and say, film, roll film, digital film, sheet film, all uh, digital film, digital, silver gelatin, gelatin silver, all types of film are based off of um, kind of the wet collodion. Now the positive negative, of course, the first was the paper negative. That's the, you cannot take that away. And I just found some paper negatives that I made years ago in my, it's kind of fun to move in a weird way. It's, it's stressful as hell, but it's kind of fun to, God, going through my stuff, I'm just amazed at the stuff I've collected over the years. I'm absolutely stunned at the stuff that I've collected over the years. Anybody have anything else? Talk, talk, talk. Let's do it, man. Anybody have anything? We're just all here chilling, right? Hey, yeah, Quinn, John here. So uh, <clears throat> looking at some uh, densitometers, and uh, I know you, you replied to my last uh, post about that, and I'm still shopping around for stuff, but I want something that's really, truly portable and something that'll fit large negatives because I'm planning to print up to about 44 inches in size on those digital negatives. So it's going to have to, you know, go across a few different mediums. So I, I put the link down there in the messages. I don't know if uh, you want to look at that real yeah. quick, but I'm kind of interested to see what your thoughts are on that particular one. Um, no, it's not cheap, but that's really not the point. It's uh, portability and the ability to be able to get that probe onto the light viewer and to be able to take those readings directly wherever I want to on that negative. Instead of having to press down one and having to limit my size of my negative, trying to go in there, I need to get something in the middle of the sheet. I'm doing a large negative that kind of matters. So yeah, I'm, yeah. I, I'd like to get your idea on that. I sent them uh, an email, but it, it, most of their stuff is uh, dedicated to like x-ray films, but sure, optical density is optical density, um, but I'm not sure if the logarithmic value or orthographic or whatever the hell that is you know I'm, I'm pretty sure you have a little bit more knowledge on that so I'm kind of looking for your opinion on that yeah that's great number one that would be the only caveat depending on how how large you want to scan or what kind of density reading how large of image you want to be able to get to because mine's only I can only push in eight inches on mine and push the little lever down right so I'm that's limited cool. to where I can take a reading that would be the right. caveat for you is the size of it's really important or the size of your negative is really important. This is perfect for it. The only thing I need to see is that density zero to five D. That's yep. that's it. I mean that after that you're done and done to my mind. Um, okay. that is that is pricey, obviously, but that's neither yep. that's not a that's 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 your thing to deal with in that if you want to spend that money on that, that's a good thing. Yeah. You know, it's, you know, it's quality. I mean, just reviewing that quickly, uh, you know, it's quality. That would be a good, good uh, scanner. To, uh, a few, uh, after a few, using that for a couple of years, you'll be able to look at your negative and tell immediately. I can usually, right. not always true, but most of the time I've used my densitometer enough that I can hold my negative up, transmit light through it. And I can say, that's about a one nine and that's about a 0.4 and get in there and I'll, I'll be really close. Not always, sometimes, especially on the D max, I can be off 0 0.2, 0 0.3. I mean, it, sometimes it stuns me. It's like, wow, I, that's amazing. And those are the times you really need to know that density and say, oh, that's, that's an albumin or salt print. That's not a, you know, whatever print, right? That, that's why we're using it. If 
Farid Laid, uh, Laid, Laid, I, I can't pronounce your last name. What about using aid white powder? Yeah, I just talked about that just a minute ago. Um, the egg white powder, we talked a little bit about that. The two problem areas with albumin paper that I've seen, um, as far as the as actual albumin, right, the egg whites, the two problem areas are the cheap store-bought and white eggs that cost a euro a dozen or two euros a dozen or whatever. And they're poorly fed chickens. They're eating sugar corn or they're eating chemicals or whatever. And they're all pinned up, you know, they're stressed out. Really produces a poor egg white for albumin. I know that for a fact. And then the second one is powdered albumin, powdered egg white. I've seen that. Um, not always. I've seen some success with them, but but most of the time it's not uh, quite there. Uh, maybe it's just my mental state. Um, when I think of albumin, I think of you know free range chickens eating bugs, running around, having a good time, living the good life, and laying these great big wonderful nice eggs. Um, I got um, my albumin was made from my dad's free range chickens on his farm and. That's the best egg. That's the best albumin I've ever had. Um, so yeah, you you try it, try it and see. Um, yes, Karim. Yes, we'll make some wonderful. Uh, yeah, I'm, that's my first livestock is chickens. So we'll make some great albumin up on the mountain for sure. Um, Sean says I'm about to start mixing my own chemistry, starting with cloning developer. Do you have any general do's and don't tips? Those are great. Um, those are great questions. Um, and Jan says I mix albumin powder for. Hylio types, oro tones with help from Peter O'Donnell shall try to make from, yeah, well, well let us know how that works, Jan, because I may be off on the egg white, the uh, powdered albumin, the egg whites. I may be off. That may be uh, something that you'll find you love, you know. Again, this is so subjective. All I can say is, is what I've seen in the past. I know for a fact that low quality eggs do not make good albumin paper. I know that for a fact. I've done that. I've done that <clears throat> for, and, and they're terrible. They're, they just do not work well. Um, let's go to Sean's question. He has, he's asking any, any tips on mi mixing collodion and developer for the first time. The first tip that I would give you is be safe, right? We, we talked about quite a bit in the past about proper ventilation. Um, we don't want to be burning candles or having a torch next to us or being sm smoking cigarettes or a cigar or whatever, right? We want to, we just want to be kind of cognizant and aware of our environment, that it's well ventilated, that we're not, we don't have any ignition sources around. You, you got ether and, and, and collodion, that kind of thing coming out. And then um, uh, take your time and don't be super, super, like over the top nervous about it. Um, myself, I, I do, I wear gloves uh, because I use a, a heavy metal. I use a cadmium in my collodion. So I wear gloves and I work in a well ventilated, but not a, uh, not a, uh, you know, I don't have a fan blowing on me or anything, uh, but I don't wear a mask. I guess you could wear a mask if you wanted. The, the, the cadmium is, if you're using cadmium, that's an airborne problem. Uh, wear gloves, good ventilation, and um, and don't get any get any big hurry. No ignition sources, of course. And don't get in a big hurry. Go over, read it twice, three times. Measure them out. Follow the steps. Um, um, if you have access to my my workshop online, the the login, go go watch those. I go through every single. Watch what I do. Watch what I do. Just go through every single. You can. That's a great visual representation. You can kind of mimic that and be safe and make a wonderful product uh, that will work well and you won't hurt anybody in the process of doing it. Um, the developer is really straightforward. Developer is not so concerning. If you're using a high concentrated glacial acidic acid, that is fairly caustic. If you get it on your skin, it will probably burn you a little bit, turn you red. It won't kill you, but it won't feel that great. Um, and you, you don't want to be breathing that either. Uh, denatured alcohol, if you're using any denatured alcohols, you need to know what that inhibitor, if it's an MEK, a methyl ethyl ketone or something like that, you don't want to be breathing that either. If you're using ethanol, you know, you're pretty much fine. People drink that stuff, but um, just keep those things in mind. Safety, 
make sure you don't have any distractions. People get super nervous about this, not just about the safety, but about screwing up the recipe and what did I do wrong? They didn't quite pay attention to this or that, or they get too many things going and they mess up mixing their chemistry. And I do, I highly recommend people mix their own chemistry. I really do. Even, even with all the safety and all that other stuff, you can do it. It's not that big of a deal. And once you do it a couple of times, it gives you that independence. And moreover, it gives you the ability to make the type of product you wanna work with, right? Again, we go back to that idea of what this is supporting my work. I want it to look this way. How do I make it look this way? And that starts with making the chemistry. You buy the chemistry from somewhere, and there's a lot of great places, don't get me wrong. There, there's, there's several great places you can uh, buy mixed chemistry. But at the, at the end of the day, you, have, um, you don't have that control, right? Kind of like growing your food. You can buy food everywhere, but if you grow your own food or you raise your own food, you have more control over that. Maybe I'm just a control freak or whatever, but at the end of the day, I want to know, I, I made a certain type of chemistry for X amount of years this way, and it produces this kind of image with these conditions. That's what I want, that consistency. I work in long, long projects, multiple year projects, and I don't want to be switched out on. I don't want things to change in the middle of that. And this image, these 10 images look this way, and these five look a different way. I, I don't want that. Remember the old paper stuff? Right, Kodak stops making this paper. Ilford stops making that paper. Oh man, they stop making this film or they stop making that film. And you're right in the middle of a project and it kind of throws a wrench in that. So I encourage you to mix your, make your own chemistry. Just do it safely and have fun. Have, have, absolutely have fun doing it. Um, if you use a fresh eggs, bait, best to wait a year, you shall use albumin on glass. The powder recipe you can use after two to three days. Uh, no, you don't have to use, wait a year, Jan. I don't know where you got that from. Where'd you, where'd you get that from, Jan? You mean a week in the fridge or something? Is that what you're talking about? I talk about, uh, I have uh, been on a workshop now for three days with uh, Peter O'Donnell. Uh-huh. And he, he has worked with this uh, for three, four years now. And uh, he said, you must have very old, very old uh, albumin from fresh eggs. It, yeah. Don't get me wrong. It's best. I've used albumin up to a year old, a little over a year old. It's smelly, but it's good. Yeah. Yes. See, so make it fast for me. I just use uh, powder and uh, some uh, sugar, uh, uh, honey. Okay. And let me ask. Let, yeah, I got you. Let me ask this question. Why, do, why would you want to wait a year using fresh eggs? What's the reason behind that? Yeah, because to, it, it's to sit on the glass. Uh, it's worked be better with powder if you have a uh, hurry. But why? So, but why? Uh, I asked him and I said, he tried for three, four years now. And he, powder is the best for him. And okay. I tried to learn from him. And that, that's fine. That's fine. Let me tell you why they're making this claim. They're making this claim because you know that little bit of... Uh, of uh, Glacial acidic acid you put in your whites when you make, make albumin, you know that little bit of two milliliters of glacial acidic acid? That breaks the proteins down in the albumin. And what you're talking about is that very thing. So when you whip it up and you froth it up and then that, that filters through and you take the froth off and you put that in your fridge over and you put that in your fridge for a week or whatever, that, man, I can make beautiful, beautiful albumin prints give me you'd have to give me a few days but with good fresh eggs a few days i can make beautiful albumin prints i've done it for many two i started making albumin prints in 2004 on and, glass uh, and, and it's glass. beautiful and, and i don't know powdered egg whites go for it i i've just seen people use them that haven't had the best of luck i have never have i've used cheap eggs and not had really good luck with them and I've used organic or range-free chicken eggs that make beautiful prints. I've never had problems. Yes, okay, but uh, on glass, you know, maybe it's, it's so easy to peel off. Oh, you, oh, you're making albumin on glass? Yes. Okay, okay. Um, let me think about this. Um, you put albumin on glass to prevent peeling, right? 
That's what we talk yeah, about. And, and, and the salt. Do you have the mixture of salt, albumin, and uh, and uh, some uh, honey? Yes. Do you have a plast plasticizer. Yeah. Exactly, the plasticizer. Exactly. So you're making albumin on glass. Okay, we're on the same page. Yes. Yeah, so I take uh, my negative from uh, the plan is taking my negative from wet plate, and then I make a positive. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. Albumin on glass. Exactly right. Now, having said that, uh, if you're having albumin peel, if you're having that amount of albumin peel on glass, um, that could be, that could be. If you, if you, if I I'm talking about floating paper, albumin on paper. When we, when we usually talk about albumin, we're talking about making paper prints, but albumin on glass, absolutely. Recipes for that all over. Um, you can have, um, uh, that strength of albumin poured on glass, you're probably talking about the way it's flowing onto the glass, okay? So I show in the video um, about albuminizing, not making albumin on glass, but albuminizing glass plates for negatives, you steam them. And why do you steam them over a humidifier or a steamer? It's so the albumin flows properly. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as albumin lifting, that's that would be an inter another interesting topic. I'm not really sure because albumin is used to to hold collodion. Albumin or egg white, you throw you throw an egg at a car, you know, and you let it dry. You try to get that egg white off; it'll take the paint off with it, right? So I'm not really sure about what what he means by that. But you know, everybody has their own little. Um, um, uh, the problem is uh, after you, uh, if you're fixing before toning, and uh, it's, uh, it's a difficult, uh, you have to tone first, and then you bind it some more. If you're fixing right after exposure, and then you clean with water, then it starts to bubble up and it's peeling off. Okay, so uh, that's, that's, that's it's okay. It's a complicated uh, process. I'm not finished yet. But yeah, thought, uh... <laughs> I, 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 see, I see what you're meaning. And I understand why you'd use the processed egg whites for that. I get that. I get that. Yeah. Yeah. It's concentrated. I, I, I understand. So you're talking about albumin on glass, making a positive. He's talking about making a positive. Rather than on paper, he's talking about making a positive image on glass, which is um, interesting. I don't know. Uh, I don't know very yeah, many people would have done that. You can have a light behind, you, you see the positive, and you can have white paper behind. Yep. Or you can use uh, acryl and colorize it. Yep. Orotones. Yep, exactly. Copper and uh, gold mixed together, yep. acryl, and then you can have black behind. Absolutely. Then you have the real depth. Yep, exactly. Yes. And you saw my oil on glass. You saw my carbon on glass. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Glass is a wonderful product to work with for a lot of these. And I encourage people to play around with that stuff. If, you know, if, if you're, you know, if it plays into what you want to do, if you're just experimenting and having fun, that's great. You know, it's, it's, it's fun to, to mess around with that. But yeah, you're absolutely uh, um, on to something there with experimenting with different media, different substrates, right? Um, I love carbon on glass. Um, I've recently fallen in love with oil, Rollins oil printing on glass. That's probably my actually favorite, um, just for many, many reasons. It's just absolutely stunning. You guys, you guys saw all that stuff. You know what I'm talking about. Um, oh, is there a risk of forming peroxides with plain USP collodion in the bottle I've never worn? No, there is not. Perox, Sean's asking about the formation of peroxides. And I'll go over this one more time. Peroxides are formed by oxidized ether, meaning um, you open a bottle of ether and expose it to oxygen. You now theoretically have the ability for that little bit of oxygen to form peroxides with the ether. They don't form overnight. They don't, it takes, usually it takes years, maybe even decades to form, usually. But in the context of this public conversation, as safety is first, I'm going to say once you oxidize that ether, you don't want to store that away for any, you know, many months at a time or years or whatever. Once you mix that together to make your iodizer, like I said earlier, you stabilize that ether now. Alcohol is a great stabilizer for ether. 
they all have some inhibitor in the ether, all, all the brands do, but alcohol is a great inhibitor. So you, re, you do away with, you mitigate, if you know, you do away with that danger of peroxides, ether forming peroxides once it's mixed with either alcohol and or alcohol and collodion both. So no problem there. Um, John says he's got his hands on 120 gra grams of 96% KCN. I'm not excited to open it. <laughs> is it a pain to find supplier willing to ship it? It is. This is my greatest fear. I, uh, I actually have quite a bit of KCN because of that reason. Having a business to attach the application help, exactly it does. For anyone looking for KCN, went through reagents. They have a 47 processing time beat or more. Yep, yep, good, that's good. So is it safe even with an uh, old unopened bottle? Unopened, safe, safe, absolutely safe, absolutely yes. Once you open that bottle and let oxygen in, that's where problems can, can have a possibility of forming peroxides. That's good, John, on the KCN. Um, here's my two cents. I've gone round and round about this over the years. Uh, some years they're saying, oh, you can't get KCN anymore. Um, a, 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 lot of, a lot of years, um, uh, chem savers would send it to me, Anita, that she's died now, but she's a wonderful lady. Her son's run it now, but she'd send it to me and I could distribute a little KCN. Um, but uh, I thought it was going to go away for a long time. I really thought they're going to, you know, no more KCN for you, uh, like the, you know, the soup Nazi. Um, but it hasn't come to that point. But just in case, because I packed up and everything, about a year ago, I bought a lot. Uh, I don't even want to say how much, but I bought a lot of KCN. So I'm probably good to go for 10 or 15 years on the mountain. And uh, we'll see what, what that fishes out to be or turns out to be. The, the idea is these companies are super paranoid here in America, especially of, of terrorists and people, stupid people doing stupid things with the stuff. So they want a business, they won't send it to you personally. They want a business, a business address. You will have to fill out paperwork. That paperwork will eventually be funneled to uh, uh, American security called Homeland Security. And you will be put on a watch list for having a hazardous, dangerous chemical. And I'm okay with that. I don't have any, I don't have any huge issues with that. So, but. So but I, I do have a question for you, though. Uh, what's the purity of the uh, KCN that you use typically? Uh, it's technical grade, which is between ninety six and ninety seven percent. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you're you're perfectly fine there, John. Right. The the grade. He's asking about. You do not need reagent grade, right? So it, it, when you get into chemistry and you start looking at buying these different chemicals, the individual chemicals, or some of them are compounds, but. Um, you'll have a uh, technical grade and reagent grade normally. Reagent grade is the really hot, pure stuff. In wet collodion, we can, 99% of the time, we can use technical grade for everything. It's, it's clear, clean enough. KCN, perfectly clean. You can also use sodium cyanide as well too. Um, I like to use potassium cyanide, but um, people freak out about cyanide, but, it gives so many benefits in the process. It, it, it gives a, a spectral sense. It, it gives you more range in a lot of ways, if you will, in your image. Um, it produces a warmer color on positives, which I personally like. I don't necessarily want the silver gelatin or the cool, cooler colors. Some people do, and that's fine. That's what you get with a weak solution of, say, um, sodium thiosulfate. You get a, a cooler color. Um, so a potassium cyanide or a cyanide fix gives you um, the warmer color and it gives you a fast clear time. Do you remember what, when we talked about what, what fixing is? Fixing uh, when you put your plate in to fix, what it does is it removes all the unexposed silver, right? So it removes all the unexposed silver and it shows you the, the, the areas that the light has struck, the thickest part being the brightest and then down to the shadow areas, it does that fast and efficiently and it doesn't leave that kind of residue behind. That's why there's short wash times, very little water used to wash, a standing pan for five minutes, eight minutes, switch it out a couple of times and you're totally archival. Um, 
I've had zero problems with positives uh, fixing them in cyanide over the years. It's just a better color, a better, better range, a better wash time, um, just everything. It's, you know, um, it's better for public performance. People don't like to sit there and watch a sodium thiosulfate fix. Oh, just give me a couple of minutes. It's not that interesting for people. Not that that ranks very high on my list, but you know what I mean. <clears throat> All right, what else, guys? I think, uh, we're, wow, we're 1128. Look at us. Well, here in Colorado, anyway. So I'm going to try to come back next week. If you guys want to join me, I'll be on uh, StreamYard. Uh, and, you know, I, I, dang, I don't know how my connection's going to be. My internet and my TV and everything shut off here Friday. <laughs> so, so uh, I'll try, let's see, let's say that. I'll try to come back next Saturday if you guys wanna join up and have a conversation. I love coming and chatting and Kareem, I will get with you brother and we'll, we'll have a chat sometime before then, before I lose my internet connection. And, uh, and keep on making plates, keep on making photographs. I love to see everything. Um, and if you have any questions, send them to me via email. I know my, my window's closing and I'm gonna get busier and busier and busier. But um, I'm still going to try to come in and do this once in a while. I'm going to go pack my bookshelf. I got, I got a couple of my books out now that I got to go pack. So you guys have a great weekend. Stay safe. Stay well. And uh, we'll see you next week. Ciao.